Gujarat. Proceeding further, I request Shri Arvind Agrawal, Director General, Sardar Patel Institute of Public Administration, to give his welcome address and introductory remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to the fourth public lecture in the series of such public lectures initiated by the Sardar Patel Institute of Public Administration together with the Pan IIT Gujarat chapter. It is a pleasure, indeed an honor for me to welcome Mr. Pavan Varma, whom I have the pleasure of introducing to you here today. But first, a, word, a few words about the public lecture series initiated by the Sardar Patel Institute of Public Administration. As a part of our diversified activities, we started in May 2012 this lecture series. The first uh, we had by uh, Dr. Alan Lichman, Professor of History uh, in USA, who spoke about the US presidential elections. He has to his credit having forecast the last seven US presidential elections with uh, absolute precision. And he does it, he has written many books on the subject and done doctorate on the subject. The second in June was by Mr. Ashok Chavla, former Secretary Finance Government of India and currently the Chairman Competition Commission of India. A very enlightening session on competition law and the common man. The third we had in August uh, which was on doing business with China. As you are well aware, China has been the most talked of country in the last uh, two or three decades and it is becoming, it has already become the number two global economic power, inching towards becoming number one. And, do, and for Gujaratis who are entrepreneurial and business minded, doing business with China is a very, very important uh, issue. China, some people feel, is a difficult or a different country to do business with. And that was the lecture we arranged for our entrepreneurs and other like-minded people. Today, friends, we have the honor to have with us Mr. Pawan Varma. Mr. Varma is a retired Indian Foreign Service Officer of 1978 batch. Graduating in History and Law, the writer-diplomat Mr. Pawan K. Verma joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1976. He was conferred an honorary doctorate degree by the University of Indianapolis, USA for his contribution to the fields of diplomacy, literature, culture and aesthetics. Mr. Verma has served in many important positions during his illustrious career. The last one, just before taking voluntary retirement, he was India's ambassador to Bhutan. A writer of depth and insight, he has written over a dozen books which you, have, you may have perused outside the auditorium. And from that we get to see the wide variety and range of subjects that he has tackled with. The India theme is the core uh, of his love and his writing. Being Indian, be Indian, the great Indian middle class and now Chanakya's new manifesto. But the most important I feel is that taking along the India theme, he has written on other diverse subjects such as on Ghalib, he has written on Lord Krishna, he has translated poetry of renowned poets of the country including Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Kafi Azmi and Gulzar. He has written a book on the Havelis of Delhi which shows his very diverse uh, mind and, uh, and knowledge. He has also translated poetry and written on other diverse subjects uh, which you may have seen. But what is most important for us is that he is not a pessimist. He does not just criticize. There are people, it's very easy to find faults and very easy to criticize. But Mr. Pavan Verma offers solutions. 
it is for us for the citizens to examine how far we can imbibe those solutions in our functioning our day to day government work or outside government work it is for the government functionaries to see how they can use the solutions to the best advantage for our country and our people and this offering solutions he has done excellently in his book chanakya's new manifesto how relevant is chanakya's philosophy today even 2300 years later mr pawan verma after taking voluntary retirement from the indian foreign service a few months ago currently is the advisor culture to the chief minister of bihar in the rank of cabinet minister friends ladies and gentlemen i would like i would request you all to give a round of applause to mr pawan verma and i welcome you sir thank you very much sir now i request shri arvind agarwal to present a bouquet to pravin verma sir now i request shri sunil parekh founder and chairman pan iit gujarat alumni association to take over and introduce today's topic ancient civilization yan republic a solution to the crisis morning friends let me also add my warm welcome to all of you and to pavan ji for sharing his time and being with us today today i hope will be a day of intellectual regeneration arising up from the vast ocean of cynicism and malaise that has spread across our country amongst all classes of people and across all ages of our people people have felt very badly let down about how we have been repeatedly missing the golden opportunity to take our great nation to the potential it has for overall development not just economic development for uplifting our poor and vulnerable and to take our rightful place on the high table in the global arena after a spark that we saw in the mid 90s and then again in the mid 2000s we seem to have now gravitated back to a level determined largely by our own collective inability to get our act together and stride forward in the world with a much needed strong confidence and a clear national purpose and strategy affecting our daily lives we the older ones here today would remember that we have seen all these features when we were growing up and we were younger many of us feel so defeated inside that we are unable to feel the pride of even being called an indian sometimes however charitable views opinions regard this kind of a statement as rather harsh and point to many facets that are doing well even though not sustainably however no one can deny that there has been a major failure everywhere of many things an important aspect is that of governance and leadership at many levels in our country today when our leaders fail us when our governance fails us when our judiciary falls prey to its own interest when our own businesses have to be repeatedly reminded and even mandated about their social consciousness and their broader role in society when our social leaders are maltreated and tarnished many of us have lost hope and have in fact become silent witnesses a bewildered citizen of india seeks a fresh ray of hope on this desolate landscape it is in this context that i had originally suggested the name of pavan verma to shri arvind agarwal to be invited and talk to us about some of these very fundamental issues that are affecting everything else today in our country it is he who has been helping us in bringing fresh perspectives and original ideas and idealism in governance i am sure you will also share and feel with him the same sense of desolation a feeling of having been let down and being swept aside by the unrepentant tide of time but unlike us he has taken up the task of looking at these issues afresh research them in detail link them to the venerable chanakya's perennial thoughts on governance and help us all seek solace and strength that only history can provide at such times i hope today's lecture would be a very interesting lecture so without much ado may i request shri pavan kumar verma to share his views today pavan ji arvind agarwal ji sunil parekh distinguished guests dear friends students let me begin by say i feel very honored for the opportunity to be here because while i speak in many forums across the country and abroad 
this is in a sense the temple of the need for institutions to begin to analyze in detail what is the current situation and what needs to be done. It's an institute devoted to public administration with a remarkable legacy of seriousness, seriousness, dedication and purpose. So it gives me very special pleasure to be here speaking to this audience. And I'm not going to give you a lecture. I want to think aloud with you because in association there is the Pan IIT Forum which in a sense represents excellence, in a sense represents achievement, in a sense represents the ability to begin to complain, contemplate on what should be the possibilities of change. So this combination to me is particularly welcome and I am grateful to you for the opportunity to be here. Today, I think an ancient civilization is at cross purposes, at crossroads with a young nation. This civilization I refer to only because I ask myself this question, does India and do Indians have the possibility, the ability, the historical legacy, the creativity to reinvent themselves? I say to you that unless you are particularly blind, you must accept that change is essential. You cannot continue and lurch along in this way. This country's potential must be achieved, it must achieve its tryst with destiny, it cannot achieve that in the foreseeable future if we do not grapple and grasp the possibility of change. And so I ask myself, do we have the civilizational energy to be able to reinvent ourselves to face the challenges that the young republic is facing. We have had an ancient civilizational background which is marked by antiquity, continuity, peaks of refinement, assimilation and diversity. Sometimes we forget that this civilizational journey has been nothing short of remarkable. But it's important to remind ourselves, not in terms of xenophobia, not in terms of chauvinism, but in terms of the fact that there was a time when we could be the yardstick of excellence and be the originator of new concepts and ideas. That is important. If 600 years before the birth of Christ, there was a man called Bharata who wrote a compendium or book called the Natya Shastra. 600 years before the birth of Christ, when most people in many parts of the world had not come down from the trees. This book of 6000 Sanskrit shlokas is not a mechanical description of the arts. This book is 6,000 Sanskrit shlokas which are a meditation on what constitutes the aesthetic experience, rasa. If this could be the level of creative endeavor so far in the past, I ask myself, what are our abilities today? Thousands of years ago, See, I want to say to you that the civilization of India has been a civilization which was based on the notion of maulik search, the power of original thought. And not only original, audacious thought. If thousands of years ago, when our sages said, Ekam Satya Vipraha Bahuda Vedanti, there is one truth, the wise people call it by different names, that was not only an original thought, 
it was also an audacious thought because the dominant stereotypical feeling of those times was leave alone truth being called by different names only what we believe is the truth if thousands of years ago i am giving random examples i said i am not going to give you a speech but i want to share thoughts with you if thousands of years ago our sages could say udara charitanam vasudev kutumbakam for the broad hearted the entire world is a family it was not only original thought it was audacious thought it was audacious because again the dominant feeling at that time was leave alone the world only those who constitute us are our family we were capable of both original and audacious thing i was just discussing before i came in the remarkable achievements in mathematics and astronomy we were the yardstick of excellence i visited the other day the ruins of a remarkable monument in this country nalanda 1200 years ago the harvard of asia 2000 professors 10000 students with students coming from as far west as turkey and as far east as japan read hyun sang's account of the quality of educational discourse the interrogation the query the questioning the response the nature of the curriculum the encouragement to independent thinking that was the yardstick of excellence chanakya himself and i'll come to him later 1500 years before machiavelli the first man in the world who wrote a holistic thought out systematic organized political treatise in the world it did not happen in south america or papua new guinea it happened in india are we capable of reinventing ourselves any field of creative expression sir any field i don't know many of you have been to elora and there is a kailash temple and that kailash temple represents originality and audaciousness in architecture which has few rivals in the world the concept was to take an entire mountain and to excavate it from top down excavating 200000 tons of stone to build a temple of exquisite beauty to precise geometrical symmetry it's there i asked shashi tharoor the other day why do you sit in sastri bhavan then dump of an office we were capable of it we were capable of it and with the coming of islam this muslims came as conquerors and proselytizers but there is something in this civilization that ultimately we developed that syncretic ganga jamuni culture of which among many other examples the most outstanding example still is the taj mahal which is such a fusion of both hindu and islamic motifs bringing together in a sense the best of both cultures we were we were we were part of that journey and we had the capacity of dialogue dissent and dissent i mean the other day i was asked on some television program why is it that the political class has become so intolerant to criticism and there were people from other parties as well i said bhai ab jab ye aadat ho gayi hai ki apni hi party mein koi kisi ko kuch nahi bol sakta leader ko to bahar ke kyon sunenge कल मैं बोल रहा था एब्सोल्यूट लीडर एब्सोल्यूट फॉलोअर्स एब्सोल्यूट सब्जेक्ट्स बात पर वहां जुबान कटती है वो कहें और सुना करे कोई बट देर वॉज अ टाइम आई मीन आई थॉट आर कमिंग टू मी इन ट्रेंड ऑफ शंकराचार्य हु रिवाइव हिंदुइज्म आफ्टर बुद्धिज्म वॉज एट इट्स असेंट 
and Shankaracharya who revived Hinduism, Shankaracharya writes, Name Ragadvesha, Name, Name Mohalob, Mado Neva, Me Neva, Matsarya Bhava, Na Dharmo, Na Charto, Na Kamo, Na Moksha, Chidananda Rupa, Shrivo Ham Shivo. The very reviver of Hinduism says that the four Purusharts of Hinduism, Dharma, Arth, Kama, Moksha, none of them exist. He demolishes even as he builds. That is the quality of this civilization. And this is the state from which Mahatma Gandhi came. Originality, audacious thought. This man could adopt a strategy of ahimsa to take on the most powerful enemy, in, uh, the most powerful empire of the world. That was audacious thinking, it was original thinking and it succeeded because of its capacity of being based on maulik soch, the audacity of thinking. Is the young republic capable of it? We have to ask ourselves. I cannot rewind history, no one can to take it back to the golden age of the Guptas. Up to the golden age of the Gandhis or NDA or UP to hogi. Or when, whatever other combination. So we have to deal with the situation. I wrote this book, Chanakya's New Manifesto, to resolve the crisis within India because I felt there needs to be a holistic response, a compilation of ideas which begin to examine the subject of change. On the assumption that change is essential. See, you can shut your eyes. You can put your hand, head in the sand. You can be a great believer and worshipper of some deity and believe a solution will parachute in from the sky. But hoga ne? So we have to find the change. We draw the inspiration from a civilizational journey. Are we capable of it ourselves today? Chanakya when I began to study and read him, he had some qualities. The first is, he believed in identifying what the real problem is. What happens today is that we get mesmerized by the symptoms. We discuss them in drawing rooms every day. But you have to put your finger key, what is the real problem? Chanakya believed, Chanakya believed in leadership. Chanakya believed in talent. He could not suffer fools gladly. Chanakya believed, and this is the myth that you must understand that is wrong when you read the Arthashas. Chanakya believed in the welfare of the people as a whole. Chanakya believed in economic prosperity. Constitutions mean nothing if the treasury is empty. Chanakya believed that systems should be just and those who commit wrong must be punished adequately under the law. Chanakya believed in analyzing systems. We get obsessed with individuals. You must analyze systems. Because when you analyze a system and then know that what is the problem with the system, then your response is systemic. So you must analyze systems. And Chanakya believed that ultimately, if it is a choice, the nation comes before the individual. Now these are qualities. You may agree or you disagree with them. He had Clarity of mind, rigor of intellectual discipline, to see a problem, to juxtapose it to a situation, to rigorously analyze it, to propose a solution and then the courage and resolve to follow it, to achieve it. These are qualities that I admire today. 
There is not everything in the Artha Shastra that needs endorsement. Nor do I need to go into the minutiae of the Artha Shastra. Because it is contextual to its times. I am drawing the inspiration of the person who wrote it for his methodology. For his intellectual vigor. For his vision. For his clarity of mind. That is what is important. We need it in India today. There is too much waffle going on. That rigor of analysis is missing. So for these reasons I called it Chanakya's new manifesto to resolve the crisis within India. And it deals with five subjects which I believe are at the core of the crisis. Governance. The functioning of democracy. Corruption. National security. And fifthly, how do we build a genuinely inclusive society? I believe these five, you can have a laundry list of many other problems. But essentially I believe other problems are subsumed under these five. And then the idea was not to merely describe the symptoms. I read books after books. Where people restrict themselves to the symptoms, so that's what we also know. Mr. Hazur, if you are better with me, you can write better with me. You... Governance, the functioning of democracy, corruption, national security, and the building of a genuinely inclusive society. Where was I? You broke my train of thought. Ha. Ha. You see, I decided that if we take up these issues, then you must describe, take the issue and then come out with a solution. As Arvindji said, I, I am an optimist. Kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hawari. Par kab tak ubregi kon janta hai? बाद मरने के मेरे बाहर आई। How long? How much wasted potential? Even if the system does not collapse, please try to compute the lost potential. Year after year after year, who is going to be responsible? In the ebb and flow of life and daily routine, we believe if we close our eyes, तो कल तो शायद सुबह अच्छी हो। but please understand this and I say this with seriousness and I say it as an optimist. This is not a crisis about an individual. It is not a crisis about one party. It is not a crisis about one international economic crisis. And it is not a crisis which will go away with the next general elections. A systemic crisis requires a systemic response. Now why is it systemic? You see, the real problem is, and I do not have time to go into the details of the book. The book is available. Please take the trouble to read it because I always tell even the young. I meet the young a lot and I tell them mere anger, mere alienation, mere discontent, even if you express it on Raisaina Hill next to Rashpati Bhavan, means nothing. It will be... If it is just that, it will be co-opted, subsumed, derailed and taken over by the establishment. Anger must engage with ideas. Then it becomes a potent force. Then you produce something. So what is the problem? So you have to read. I wish I could have written Chanakya's new manifesto as a love story or a romance or... Easy fiction. But not possible. These are concrete situations. I will still say with great humility it's readable. But I mean I can't make it sexy you know. It's straight and simple facts about our life which we must engage with. Now what is the real problem where governance and democracy. Put your finger on the problem. I have put it on it as I see it. Today 
as far as both these areas are concerned, we are in a situation which was not envisaged by our constitution makers. Our constitution makers envisaged a situation where democratic elections will throw up a party with a stable majority which will then have five years to govern to give back to the people why they voted them in power in the first place. Now for the last 15 years, I am talking of central, for the last 15 years we have seen that that one Banyan party rule is over and we have coalitions of 22 or 24 member parties either with wafer thin majorities or precarious majorities. As a result of it, all energies go to political management and survival and very little less left to governance. I am not against the proliferation of parties. In a sense, it is the democratization of politics. There was a situation where the Congress party as the Banyan party kept getting repeated majorities in parliament. But there were other voices waiting to be heard. Today they have a chance. I was once in the Prime Minister's office and when cabinet meetings were held, there was one MP who was from a party of which he was the sole MP. Ek lok, ek admi ki party thi. But majority was also only one. <laughs> so, whatever happened, people heard him. That is not the issue. I am not against that. I am against, against the fact that when so many parties have arisen, and governments are formed by 22-24 member coalitions, what do we need to do with the system so that it becomes a functioning and effective means of governance as well? Because if all energies go to political management and survival, That is the problem. You cannot have governance without democracy because governance will become authoritarian and you cannot have democracy without governance because that takes away the very faith for which people vote in elections and it the amazing alchemy that happens is that when governments are unstable inherently even when they govern they adopt short term populist policies they are living for the next week, not for the next few years. They adopt populist policies and refuse to engage with long-term solutions to foundational problems. Who suffers? And it changes the nature of the opposition also. The opposition instead of being a constructive critique of government in the interests of the people becomes what is called a predatory opposition. It is less concerned with the merits of an issue or demerits. It is more concerned what is the potential of that issue to either embarrass or topple the government. So all around all the constituents then Produce the great sound and fury of democracy, but alas, not the light and enlightenment of governance. Kya kare? That is the question before the nation. I propose a solution. I propose a solution which is doable under the law. A great deal of it is based on recommendations already made by the election commission and essentially that is that the voter cannot be taken for a ride anymore. I say to you that if coalitions have become the norm, Arunji I hope this is not becoming too political but it's all about public administration. I say to you that if coalitions have become the norm by and large I ask all coalitions to announce who their constituents will be prior to the elections. 
You don't have to agree with me. Please come up with better solutions. That is my feeling. I was told the other day that no, no, coalitions can be formed after the elections. I said that happens mostly, if not entirely, when individual parties fight. Then they are short of a majority. Then they look to form a coalition. But here people are going ab initio with coalitions. Why should the voter have a situation where he votes for party A because he doesn't like party B, then finds after the election that party A and party B are sleeping in the same bed? Why? Who has been fooled? Kuch to saddhaan thonge, kuch aapki soch hogi, jis mein, achha, soch apne aap to aati nahi hai political class ko. So, I say that once you have this pre-announced coalition, among many other things, it must at least do two things. One, it must announce who its prime ministerial candidate will be. The Prime Minister is a very important fulcrum of the polity. You cannot have an individual chosen because of intra-coalition compromises and put there. Who cannot govern. Who doesn't have leadership qualities. Who has no vision. Or even if he has, it has long gone to sleep. And secondly, that entire coalition must pledge itself to a new document which I call the governance agenda. This is not the manifesto. The manifesto promises everything under the sun and sky. The, the election commission has provided a prototype of a workmanlike document not long specific on what will be your governance agenda if you come to power. The people are entitled to know before their vote is taken for a ride. I wish to know who is it that is going to be part of this coalition, who its leader will be and what its governance agenda will be. I am not your cannon fodder so that you come to power. I am the voter. I am entitled to know. Now on this basis if say that a coalition comes to power, pledged prior to the elections to be part of the coalition and pledged to a governance agenda placed before the people and having received the people's vote on that basis, it comes to power. I propose that all the members of that coalition have a lock-in period for three years when none can withdraw support. It is very much like the anti-defection law. That is also an infringement of absolute democratic choice. But you introduced it in order to make democracy functional. Where you curbed an individual proclivity in order to preserve the effectiveness and ethics and rectitude of the polity as a whole. You've come together, you've pledged together, you wish to... Now, no one party can hold that to ransom for a minimum period of three years lock-in period. At least then for three years, you have, without the threat of political instability, the possibility of governance. People can take decisions. I was told, will this not become tyrannical? I said, in the past, when you had one party with 401 seats come to power, how was it different? Nobody could topple it. It could take any decisions almost under the sun. It had such an absolute majority. So what is wrong in creating a situation which is a democratic artifice, a zariya hai, that you hold together this coalition and say, you have pledged to this governance of agenda. It's not 30 years that you must be brothers with each other. Teen saal. And after that, if you wish to leave, you can form a new government, but only for a remaining two-year period, where again there will be a lock-in period for two years. But the voter does not forget if you left a well-functioning coalition government, only for opportunist reasons for two years, it will punish you. That is one, one idea, many, among, among many others. But then how do we otherwise resolve it? Otherwise next year we have elections. I can guarantee you the horse trading, the multiplicity of coalition partners. Everything will happen except the promise of governance. In democracy, there are many other challenges. The biggest is electoral reform. 
biggest that is the beach of both corruption and so much that is ill this evening i am speaking to judges and lawyers in delhi i'm going to tell them koi aur nahi karega to aap hi initiative lijiye all the proposals for change are already recommended by the election commission i was once speaking sir at the lal bahadur academy which i go every year to address and before me virappa moili sahab had spoken now he has authored a report an 800 page report called the second administrative reforms commission so i began by saying that you just heard a speaker who has not read three pages of his own report it lies in godam mein padi rehti बेस्ट आइडियाज कोई पढ़ने को तैयार नहीं है कोई सोचने को तैयार नहीं है तो भाई देश का उद्धार कहां से होगा वन प्रोविजन फॉर ब्लैक मनी एंड पॉलिटिक्स वन प्रोविजन टूडे देर इज अ लॉ विच सेज दैट पोलिटिकल पार्टीज कैन रिसीव डोनेशन बाय नॉट नेमिंग द डोनर प्रोवाइडेड द डोनेशन इज लेस देन ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड रुपीज parties have collected hundreds of crores without knowing who where it's come from this is sabne sab 19999 the election commission has recommended time and again that this law be repealed and it can be and all bank gadbadi aur thodi bahut तो ये तो बड़ा मुश्किल है हिंदुस्तान में पूरा हटाना बट सिस्टमिक चेंज मींस ऑल फाइनेंशियल ट्रांजैक्शंस मस्ट बी डन थ्रू द बैंक टुडे देर इज टेक्नोलॉजी विच कैन डिजिटली ट्रैक मोस्ट फाइनेंशियल मूवमेंट्स योर पार्टीज अकाउंट्स विल बी वेटेड बाय अ चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट अपॉइंटेड बाय द इलेक्शन कमीशन एंड द एनफोर्समेंट डिरेक्टरेट योर अकाउंट विल बी ऑन वेबसाइट it will be under the rti if you are caught both the donor and the party will be penalized including deregistering steps that can be taken that have been recommended by the election commission the election commission tells me that every time it goes up to the standing committee of parliament every time they send up 23 proposals the standing committee of parliament sends them all back except adopting two that policemen should wear longer shirts and wear better caps to all these proposals the ghalib ki sher yaad hai har ek baat pe kehte ho tum ke tu kya hai tum hi kaho ki ye andaaz e guftagu kya hai they propose they dispose i was telling a vast gathering of students the other day do nothing else use your greater greatly magnified powers through the cyber world 1 million petitions that before the next election parliament must fulfill its promise of convening a special session of parliament only on electoral reform criminalization of politics what is the problem i was discussing this two days ago with the supreme court judge he said yes it should be done it's doable today what's the situation a politician accused of a criminal act he remains qualified to be in democratic politics unless he is proven guilty in other words you are innocent unless proven guilty so a particular chief minister was accused in 95 he had to resign he thought his wife is the best substitute he made her the chief minister subsequently thanks to our dilatory judicial proceedings he became the, law, uh, the railway, railway minister of india you have to resign there but you have not yet ever been proved guilty in 2004 his party becomes part of the ruling coalition the case is conveniently given to cbi the cbi in 2012 only frames charges he i'm sure he'll occupy some more cabinet posts so the principle is very simple where democratic politics are concerned if there is a criminal charge i have proposed this if there is a criminal charge 
एंड द कोर्ट सीज प्राइम फेसी रीजन टू फ्रेम चार्जेस यू आर डिबार्ड फ्रॉम डेमोक्रेटिक पॉलिटिक्स अनलेस प्रूवन इनोसेंट बिकॉज इन टू थाउजेंड फोर देर वॉज अव एंड क्राई बिकॉज ट्वेंटी एट परसेंट ऑफ आर पार्लियामेंट कंसिस्टेड ऑफ पार्लियामेंटेरियन विद क्रिमिनल रिकॉर्ड इन टू थाउजेंड नाइन आफ्टर दैट यू एंड क्राई द फिगर वेंट अप टू थर्टी थ्री परसेंट of which 14% by the way see you have to stand up proud and say i am an indian 14% have heinous crimes against them of murder abduction rape dacoity and they are there making laws for you and they are saying we are innocent unless proven guilty So you have to change this. You have to put it on its head, and you have to have fast track courts for it, so that decisions are taken in four months. The number of appeals are reduced. Once convicted, even if you go on appeal, you are debarred from politics because in the temple of democracy, only those who are un- indisputably clean in terms of their public profile have the right to represent Indians. That is the requirement. it can be done it's already proposed take one guess who is preventing it from happening it's the members of parliament themselves so we have to think similarly the absence of inner party democracy the way our parliament functions see please start thinking in the entire history of the house of commons in the united kingdom parliament has not been adjourned for a single day 